This is the Getsy Health Podcast with Janique and Tristan Roney. Hey, you guys. Welcome back to the Getsy Health Podcast. Uh, we have Gina Warfel with us. She's my co-host. And we have a very, very, very special guest, Tamara Rubin. Welcome, ladies. Hi, everybody. Hi, <laughs> thanks for having me. You guys, you may or may not have heard Tamara's name in the news or in the media. Online, she is Lead Safe Mama. Her Instagram handle is at Lead Safe Mama. Her website is www.leadsafemama.com. And she has a documentary called Miss Lead. And if it's not obvious, our topic today is about lead, heavy metals. We're going to mainly talk about the lead issue and how this is. What is it that you coined a Tamara? A silent epidemic. Why is that? Yeah. It's interesting because a lot of people have used that since then, because I've been saying that for over a decade now. But the reason it's a silent epidemic or a secret epidemic is because there's no uh, outward symptom. Like one of the experts in my film talks about, we didn't actually include this in the film. If it was a disease or if it caused a disease that left you with bright orange, purple spots all over your body, Mm -hmm. people would know about it. Mm -hmm. And since it's a disease that leaves you with, non-specific symptoms that many attribute to other causes or and uh, the causes unidentified or the the fact that there's a causal link between lead poisoning and whatever the these other symptoms might be and I'll get into that later but since it's a non-specific correlative or causal uh, link in terms of the visual impacts in terms of what people experience and see people think it's not a problem. They don't know, they don't understand the gravity of the problem. Right. And the main issue is that it causes so many things because it's a, it's one of the most potent neurotoxins known to man. And it also impacts pretty much every biological system. And for example, one of the non-specific impacts is ADD, ADHD, you know, that so many kids are suffering from that Mm -hmm. in a way that is, pretty profound. Like there's a lot of effort in the media to dismiss the impacts of ADHD. But those of us who have children who have severe ADHD know that it's real. And then those of us who have had that link to their lead exposure know that that link is real. And also the doctors, the scientists, Dr. Lamphere and others have done extensive research showing the the links between ADHD and severe ADHD and lead exposure. Just, I mean, on top of that, we've got, you know, kidney disease, increased risk of heart disease, arthritis, memory impairments, all these things that people think are old age, Mm -hmm. but are really old age in a new way linked now since the post-industrial revolution time. And the one big change we've had is the pervasiveness of lead in our air, water, soil, and environment as a whole. Well, and would you say that the majority of the population or of citizens think that lead is actually illegal in the United States? Oh, yeah. And yeah. and it's prevalent. It's in everything, wow. everything. So we're going to go into your story in a little bit, but I want listeners to really tune in right now because you have found lead in dishes, in children's toys. And this is like far above and beyond legal limits, far above and beyond. What else have you found it in? You have still found it in paint. Um, so what is it still allowed in? Lead is still legally allowed in gasoline, Mm -hmm. even though people think it was banned. You can go to gas stations across our country and find leaded gasoline pumps, or um, you can find leaded gasoline that you can purchase it by, you know, the container full. Lead is still allowed in paint as long as it's not house paint. Lead is still allowed in jewelry as long as it's not meant for children. It's allowed in cosmetics. It's allowed in machining equipment. Once it's in machining equipment of products that are manufactured, that machining equipment contaminates any product. Mm -hmm. A product especially known as like chocolate. Chocolate's a big one that is heavily Mm -hmm. lead contaminated because they're still spraying pesticides with lead in in third world countries. Mm -hmm. It's being delivered in like, well, the tractors are still using lead based, you know, gasolines. And then it's shipped on shipping containers, which are still allowed to be painted and use like gas materials. Like it's being exposed from lead source to lead source to lead source. Sorry, I, I interrupted you, but you mentioned paint, like our bridges, our our road paint, like all of that has lead in it. It's shocking. Yeah, um, 
So what are the different ways that the, the lead actually comes off from all these places? It, is it, do we inhale it and it's just coming off? What about like toys? Like, does it, you know, how is it actually coming off? Is it just leaving the material and we can ingest it or we can breathe it in or we can, you know? Yeah, the main forms of exposure are inhalation and ingestion. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because skin absorption is controversial. And mm. I think one of the reasons it is controversial is because just because there's been limited study. I think that that if we did some more studies, we'd find more evidence of potential for skin absorption of, of lead. The main concern is ingestion. But the thing is, it's not like eating paint chips. That's the myth. It, a child doesn't need to eat a paint chip to be poisoned. And for those of us who are parents of lead poisoned children, we get really upset when people boil it down to that or when people joke about eating paint chips. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, Stephen Colbert made a joke about eating paint chips recently. And I'm just like, stop, stop, mm -hmm. you know? And I actually wrote him and tweeted at him. <laughs> like, people don't understand. You wouldn't make a joke about another uh, marginalized population mm -hmm. in that way. And people are still making jokes about people being eating paint chips and that's why they're stupid. Oh and my gosh. There are, there are children who eat paint chips and those stories are tragic and I'll share one with you in, in that mm. just as an example. It, the child didn't like pick paint chips off the wall necessarily. This one child I know who's severely disabled, when he was mm. a little baby, his parents lived in an apartment where there was construction going on next door. So what are little boys like? And I'm sorry for gender stereotyping, little children like. What are little children like? Tractors. They love watching mm -hmm. the, the construction equipment. Um, so he would sit by the window mm -hmm. and watch the tractors build and, and, you know, the construction equipment build the new building next door. And he would take his little cup of goldfish crackers and he would dump them out in oh, the windowsill. Yeah. And he would sit and eat his goldfish crackers one by one from his windowsill. Well, what was he eating with those? He was eating the paint chips that were in the windowsill and oh. in the window. Well, he wasn't eating paint chips. He oh was eating gosh. goldfish crackers. And so, yeah, you can wow. eat paint chips and that will cause severe disabilities. But normally it's dust. It's mm -hmm. micro dust that you can't see. Yeah. Generally dust caused by renovation mm -hmm. from older homes. That's the most significant source of lead exposure. And what people don't understand, and there's a this post about all of everything I say, there's a post about it on my blog. <laughs> <laughs> but this thing, uh, a lot of the scientists say or talk about how it takes a sugar packet worth of lead dust to contaminate an entire football field. Mm, so if you take a sugar packet and you and pretend that's lead dust and you ground it up evenly and spread it evenly across a football field. That's enough to contaminate a football field to 38 yeah. micrograms of lead dust per square foot. Yeah. It used wow. to be, yeah, the, the hazard level used to be 40 micrograms that they said was enough to poison a child, but they now know and have known for a couple of decades that levels as low as five micrograms of lead dust per square foot can poison a child. And that's Dr. Lamphere's work and he's in my film. So one half of a sugar pack would be 20, almost 20 and one quarter would be almost 10. So it's one eighth of a sugar packet mm -hmm. spread evenly across a football field mm -hmm. is enough lead dust to poison a child. Unbelievable. Wow. That's insane. Well, and what listeners need to understand is this is not a poor and minority community issue. This is an everybody issue. Do your children have toys that are plastic? Do they have boats? Do any toys have any kind of metal in it? There's probably lead in that. Probably. Yeah, well, I do want to give people some hope, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> as much as there's lead in everything, in a lot of everything, it's not in quite everything, but in quite a few things, we also need to not be afraid and we need to not live life in fear. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people that in general, new toys made after 2011 are going to be lead free, especially if they're mass manufactured by major brands Amazing. like, I don't know, Mattel or Fisher Price or even green toys. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of toy companies that are being compliant with the new regulations. The regulations went into effect in 2008. So people say, oh, after what year are toys safe? And I say 2011. And they're like, what? You mm -hmm. know, how is that possible? What are you talking about? I'm like, well, we actually didn't have regulatory standards until 2008 and it took years for those to phase in and it took years for companies to phase in compliance. And they mm -hmm. were given the time to phase in compliance. Mm -hmm. So post-2011 toys really should be safe, although there are exceptions. And the exceptions are 
like with the fidget spinners where mm-hmm. Target said, oh, those aren't for children. I'm like, what? Wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, if they're not manufactured for children, then they potentially have unsafe levels of lead, cadmium, antimony, sometimes even mercury and mm-hmm. arsenic. And so that's where you have to kind of definitely read the labels mm-hmm. and not... Okay, so I don't, do you have, you have children, I'm assuming? Yes. <laughs> How do. old are they and what, are they boys and girls? I or? have a seven-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. So I'm lucky in a way that this is not my problem yet. Well, it might be eventually, but I, um, I only have boys and they're not that into jewelry, although my 12-year-old is getting into jewelry, so mm-hmm. this might change. But my biggest concern when it comes to this kind of mix-up where parents buy things for children that aren't intended for children is costume jewelry. Mm. Because the little girls wanting to play dress up, and again, I'm gender stereotyping, I, I'm 51, we do this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, there's, you, you think about it, it's in our imagery of little girls playing with jewelry and doing dress up. And, and again, my kids do dress up too, but but it's the jewelry that that's the problem because parents go to the store and say, Oh, look at this cheap piece of jewelry. It's lovely. My four-year-old daughter would have so much fun playing with this Mm -hmm. and they buy it. Not thinking there's a warning that for children over 16, because it contains toxic chemicals that, and those shouldn't be played with by young children. Right. So like, would that be enough that you would say really no one should be wearing cheap jewelry, even as an adult? Well, again, there's always hopeful exceptions to this, but yes, there's a, you touched on two issues there, cheap jewelry and adults. <laughs> and so the problem is that all of these standards are only for children, but that doesn't mean that these toxic levels of chemicals don't impact adults. Right. It's just that the regulatory standards have not been applied to the adult arena because then manufacturers wouldn't be able to make all of this stuff. Oh. Yeah, it's poisonous to adults too especially the cadmium levels found in a lot of the newer jewelry, mm-hmm. but there's no regulatory limit. And so then in terms of costume jewelry, I say if it's vintage, I mean, the biggest offender is your grandmother or your mother, depending on how old you are, your vintage faux pearls. Mm. They, Interesting. If they feel and look like real pearls, if they're heavy and if you bite them and they feel like they might be pearls, which that's how we tell if a real pearl is a pearl, we bite it. Um, They can be made of leaded glass painted with lead paint and they can be 300,000 parts per million lead. And the toxicity level for lead in toys is 90 parts per million. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that said, the hope part is I've been to Target. I did these gorilla XRF testing videos and XRF technology is what I use to test consumer goods for for toxicants, heavy metals. Mm -hmm. I'm trained and certified in using this instrument that can you explain that a little bit, that instrument, how that works? A yes, because yeah. I saw it in your documentary and I was looking at that. I'm like, can anyone just buy that and test stuff in their house? Like, how do we do this for ourselves? So go ahead and tell us about this instrument that you yeah. have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you have $50,000 and it's oh. time to be verified, you can totally buy one yourself. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> and some people do have $50,000 and, and buy one themselves. I don't <laughs> right now. And I... I've managed at some point I had a relationship with the company and they loaned me one for free for a couple of years. And then that didn't work out because of politics. It's interesting. It's Always. Thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I got my hands on a used one. You can get a used one for usually between 25 and $30,000. Mm-hmm. The problem is if you, or if your readers or listeners go to eBay and look for a used XRF instrument, they're going to find used ones for five or $10,000. The problem is that's not the right instrument. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. The instrument I use is the one specifically used by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. It's, it's a fancy, different one than most people use. The instrument that, that most people use is just for testing for lead and paint, and it tests in milligrams per centimeter squared. The instrument I use tests for all metals that are detectable with an XRF instrument. And that's most metals. Like I can test for silver and gold and platinum, you know, and cobalt and barium and all the metals. And it does it with an algorithm that represents the metals in parts per million. Mm -hmm. So the cheap instruments only test for lead and use a radioactive source and don't test in parts per million. The expensive instrument meant for testing consumer goods is a non-radioactive tube-based x-ray, tests uh, in parts per million, and tests more metals other than lead. 
And the interesting thing is, so people sometimes say, oh, I'll just test for lead and I'm just going to use the cheap instrument. But the problem is, and this gets very sciencey, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we like science. Yeah, we're really into this right now. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> so I, I actually teach classes. I've taught classes in college settings and, and elementary school and middle school. I have fun uh, when I come in as a guest teacher and, I, and I, I really love talking about clients. So the problem is that the lead based paint instruments do readings in milligrams per centimeter squared. Mm -hmm. And so their low threshold of detection is one milligram per centimeter squared in most cases. And so if they get a number that's less than one milligram per centimeter squared, say, for example, you have a lead hazard inspector doing inspection on your home and you ask them to test a toy and the toy comes in negative per his test and it, because it came in less than one milligram per centimeter squared. Well, one milligram per centimeter squared lot. is roughly equivalent to 5,000 parts per million. Right. So wow. It's not negative. Right. It's not negative even by any standards and, except a federal standard. And remind people how many parts per million is actually acceptable. Yeah, so so the current federal standard and also the international standard, and that's why I've been using this number since, well, since before it was the federal standard, I've been talking about it, is that in um, paint glazer coating of an item intended for use by children, it's not supposed to be more than 90 parts per million lead. Mm -hmm. And in the substrate, which is like the ceramic underneath the glaze, yeah. it's not supposed to be more than 100 parts per million lead. Right. So we have these paint-based hazard assessors going, testing people's toys with the wrong instrumentation, telling them they're negative when they really could be as much as 4,000, 5,000 parts per million lead. Right. So I'm going to try and like break this down for people in like, I'm going to use sugar, for instance, because most people know that we're only supposed to get like 24 grams of sugar a day. So this would be like an inspector. You, you take a cake to an inspector and be like, inspector, I need to eat less than 24 grams of sugar a day. Can you test this cake to make sure that it has less than 24 grams of sugar a day? His instrument will only tell you if it has less than a thousand grams of sugar. Exactly. So let's say the cake has 500 grams of sugar and he's testing the cake and he's like, it's negative. Look, it has no sugar in it. You're safe. And you're like, yay. So now you go and eat this cake that has 500 grams of sugar in when you're only supposed to be in 24. But it's OK because his instrument told you there's less than a thousand. Is yeah. that kind of what you, what's happening? That's an interesting analogy. Yeah. <laughs> Does that kind of, I hope that makes sense to people because, because these are a lot of buzzwords that you're using. And so a lot of people probably won't be able to like translate it. And so that's why I say like, you know, it's, it's comparable to that. It's saying, well, it's less than a thousand. So you're fine. And my, my machine says there's nothing in it because there's less than a thousand. My machine only tests over a thousand. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's ridiculous. It's unsafe. We're being misled into this false narrative of safety when really our exposure to these things is above and beyond safe limits. Right. And again, I'm going to step back. I, I love that you're outraged. I think I, I, <laughs> I watched your documentary last night. That's why I'm outraged because like, I'm not even kidding. So I was, I want to tell listeners this. I was watching it with my best friend who's staying with me from South Africa and she was watching and she was outraged and she's like, I need to be on this podcast. I need to be the one in the background gasping and saying, that's insane. And I'm like, I have another mic. I have another mic. It can be the four of us chatting. No, she was outraged too. So that's why I'm like all fired up about this because it's really, it's really sad to me that I have not heard of this epidemic ever. I thought I was a very intelligent person and I thought I was very well read, but that there's no protection. No one cares. We'll talk about that later, but keep going. Well, that's one of the scenes in my movie where I say basically what you just said to, to the EPA scientist, mm -hmm. uh, Ronnie. Well, I thought I knew about this. I thought yeah. I knew what I knew and I had no idea what I knew. And I thought and I, I rationalized it. I said, oh, I don't know what I thought I knew because I was born after the ban. Or right. I was born, you know, I was a little kid when the ban on lead paint happened. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is the reason I don't know what I thought I knew or what I thought I knew isn't right is because of the politics of it. And we mentioned yeah. that earlier before we started and that the, the politics 
are such that the lead industry has made a concerted effort to intentionally hide this information right. from us, that to, to hide the damaging impacts of lead, to limit the knowledge of the correlative impacts between lead and health impairments, mm-hmm. specific health impairments that have financial you know, costs associated with them so that people can't be freaked out in that way. My favorite report, and again, I'm I'm a geek on this stuff. I know way too many nuances, but one of my favorite reports is a report from Dr. Leonardo Trasande, who worked at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York and then went to NYU Medical Center. And he's a pediatrician, but also a researcher and epidemiologist, I think, uh, to some degree. And he did a report showing that the total cost of all environmental contaminants combined on the health of our children. So we're talking about mercury and BPA and Mm -hmm. glyphosate and all the different things. When you add all of this together, environmental contaminants cost on the impact of uh, of the health of our children was um, in his estimation at the time, $76.6 billion annually. Mm -hmm. Of that 76.6 billion, $50.9 billion worth of that impact came from lead. So two thirds of the impact was from lead. And one third is all the other chemicals combined. Well, and here's another thing that you guys brought up in the documentary is if we instill laws to help protect children and to clean up the environment, not only would you be making jobs, but you'd be stimulating the economy. And then we'd be saving money long term on health care and damage control, basically, for lack of a better word. But why is that not happening? Yeah. Well, and so that's the other fun, disgusting answer, fun, disgusting. This is like a fun fact in a, in a weird way, I guess is what I'm saying. The lead industry has made record profits every year, year over year, every year. So every year the lead industry publishes reports that show that they made more profits than they ever made before. So a substance we thought was banned, a substance we thought that was illegal, this industry is making more and more and more money. Who are they selling their product to? So there's two, there's two main usages of it. And then there's all these other kind of peripheral usages that, that we see like, so the peripheral usages are lead in glaze and lead in paints mm-hmm. and lead in gasoline, things where really it's, it's minor, but they're still, it's they still, still have those avenues. The two main sources of the income from the lead industry are, Batteries for cars mm. and bullets. Well, hmm. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that insane? That's insane. So, yeah. The one thing people don't get is when we talk about the NRA and we talk about the, you know, the gun industry as a rule, they, they think of it as a gun industry. Well, it's not a gun industry. There's, there's not a lot of money in the guns. All mm-hmm. the money is in the is lead. In- That's insane. Yeah. I, wow. That blows my mind. So people that are hunting, and actually eat their food, like their food's not contaminated with lead. Because yeah. when you're hitting that bullet, you know there's like microfiber, like metal microfibers just being blasted out of that and into whatever you're killing. And I didn't know that. And maybe you were more aware of this because you're in Utah. <laughs> but well, I, I never thought about that. Yeah. So I, I grew up near Boston and I was in the Boy Scouts. I was actually an Explorer Scout when I was 16. They let girls join. And I used to shoot 22s. So I had some experience with shooting. I'm not mm-hmm. like a, you know, it's not like I never touched a gun before, but I, and I knew the mechanics of, you know, shooting a can off of a tree stump, that sort of thing. What I didn't realize is that when you shoot a deer in the woods and you're hunting to bring that to your home for meat, you're shooting mm-hmm. it with shot that the weight of the deer is so enormous that when you hit the belly of that deer, it fragments throughout the yeah. animal. Yep. So this lead fragments throughout the animal and that's how it kills it. It bleeds to death from these tiny fragments going from its gut throughout Mm. the animal. Now what happens is hunters then cut the animal open and dump the gut pile in the forest and leave it there. So the animal Mm. doesn't weigh as much for them to carry out of the forest, which totally makes sense. And then scavenger birds like eagles and California condors who are almost were extinct eat those gut piles and become lead poisoned and die. So we have our symbol of our country, the American Eagle, dying and being lead poisoned every day from gut piles left in the wild. Now, the great thing is that hunters are conservationists at heart. They are really amazing people. They enjoy, you know, the nature and preserving nature. Uh, There's a wonderful movie called Scavenger Hunt by Wild Lens out 
about the preservation of the California condor and has interviews with hunters showing that they really want to do the right thing. The lead in bullets is not a non-starter. There are lead-free bullets and they mm. only cost a couple pennies more than leaded bullets. And guess who pioneered lead-free bullets? Who? The military. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. So Interesting. It's not, but there's this whole movement to preserve lead-free bullets as it's a constitutional right and things like that, which mm-hmm. is, you know, if you can still shoot, you can still hunt, you can still have bullets. It's just a few pennies more. Why wouldn't you choose pennies. the one that's not going to poison our environment? Well, the reason is like everything else, we, they don't know. People don't know. Education. Education. Yeah. We, we have no clue. I had no clue that there was a lead industry still that was making profits and more and more profits every year. This is insane. Is there anything else you want to mention about this industry before I go to my next question and this topic? Yeah, I guess everything. The one thing I did want to say was that that they wrote the playbook for how to obfuscate the truth. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who came up with the marketing campaigns that tried to make people feel good about things when they bought them. And the main um, industry that took their playbook, because they they figured all this out in like 1900 to 1910. And the, the main industry that everyone knows that knows is evil, that took this same playbook for marketing strategies and promotional materials to make you think that their product's safe is the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. So actually the same people who worked on the tobacco industry campaigns to make sure that you think cigarettes are safe and that your favorite doctor smokes this one brand of cigarette, those people also designed the, initially designed the, the lead poisoning obfuscation campaign, basically making you think that lead paint is safe, lead Mm -hmm. paint is good for your children, lead paint is good for your home, lead is good for the for your community. You need lead for these things. If you didn't have lead, where would you be? Lead is glorious. Mm -hmm. I want to take that a step further. And another industry that is taking a play from their playbook is the sugar industry as well. The sugar industry, very powerful lobbyists. I mean, their outreach is global and they like sugar is a legal drug and it is glorified and it is marketed and It is. They even use social media and the media to be like, it's healthy for you because it's like high fructose corn syrup is from corn. So it's technically a vegetable. You know, like this is this is what our government is allowing to happen to us. We're being poisoned. We're being drugged. We're we're having chemicals dumped into our body. I want to go back to the lead industry back in the 90s because this is in the documentary. You guys need to go watch this documentary. It's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's called Misled. But the lead industry was actually studying and keeping close tabs on the toxicity and the health effects that lead was having in Australia and America. Am I correct? Yeah, well, in the the early 1900s. Yes. They were well aware that people were getting poisoned. And and then they put out the most powerful marketing campaign called Dutch Boy. And they're like, look at this cute little Dutch boy. This Dutch boy is telling his parents to use our lead-based paint because it is so (gasps) safe and it is so clean. So you should be like this Dutch boy. This is what they do. And this is what they're still doing to us. Yeah. Don't drink the lemonade. Don't do it, guys. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and here's another one and i don't know i don't know i'm i'm gonna take a pause because you want to you might want to not include this because you're in utah so an, another one is the smaller companies and it's not fully the smaller company's fault mm-hmm. but the smaller companies once they know better they really should do better mm-hmm. and most of them do like there's the sunglass company and i found that their sunglasses had cadmium but it turned out it was just one single batch run and they figured out the the dates of the batch. They offered replacements to everyone. They got it taken care of and they fixed the problem. Yes. The same thing happened Mm. with the Jumperoo. Is that from Utah? I think the Jumperoo is from Utah. I have no clue what a Jumperoo is. I'm sorry. It's a toy. (laughs) It's a toy. It's called the Jumping Jumperoo or Jungle Jumperoo or something. And it, uh, I don't know, it's it's an expensive toy that looks like a jungle gym that people have in their house. But anyway, I found lead in the Jungle Jumperoo um, yellow bars and the company responded quickly. They figured out it was a batch issue. They issued, they reported it to the CPSC and all of this. So, you know, that's what a responsible company Mm -hmm. will do. Same thing with my favorite brand of water bottles, Hydroflask. I found lead in Hydroflask. Wow. I was like, no, our bottles are lead free. I'm like, I'm sorry, your bottles are not lead free. Then they fixed the problem and they said, here are our new bottles. Our new bottles are lead free. And I said, you know what? 
your new bottles are not lead free. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, and then, so then they fix the problem again. And now finally all the hydroflask bottles, the new ones are lead free, but most of the other aren't. Can I ask about a company? Yeah. You mentioned this in the, the documentary, Burt's Bees, their lipstick. Are they now lead free or are they not? I wouldn't You're trust sh- Burt's Bees now. Okay. Wow. Yes. I have, when my best friend and I were watching this, she's like, Shanique, you have Burt's Bees in your purse. Your daughter puts it on her face all the time. And I I was losing my mind. I was losing. I thought I was like, I'm doing my all natural. Like I'm doing good. Yes. Like this is why I feel like I need a $50,000 lead gun in my house so I can test everything. Well, Listen, even then, even, choo, choo, choo. <laughs> <laughs> I think even then you would miss Burt's Bees because we're not talking about that's the other part. OK, well, we'll get, there's so many layers. here. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's OK, so the items like the baby food issue and the cosmetics issue, most of that is not XRF detectable lead. So there we're talking about, in many cases, parts per billion. And there's 1,000 parts per billion and one part per million. Mm -hmm. The low threshold of detection for the XRF instrument is one part per million. So you can test negative with an XRF, but still have toxic stuff that's food or something that goes on your body. Mm -hmm. Um, However, uh, with some of the lipsticks, I've got some cheap knockoff lipsticks. So the way my blog works is I have a core of about 60,000 pretty hardcore readers um, I have last year, I had over a million readers the year before I had like 1.5, but it dipped a little bit because of COVID, but I had like close to 1.2 million readers last year, 60,000 of those are my friends, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you can <laughs> and those 60,000 people interact with me pretty much on a regular basis. I'm a little overwhelmed. And they send me things to test. And so I'm clueless because mm. I'm a little bit older than you guys. Like I said, I'm 51. So I don't know what's popular now with young moms. And I don't know what everybody's using in their homes. Plus I'm kind of a Luddite and I don't, I don't buy consumer goods so much yeah. because I just don't. But so they tell me what I should test. So this one mom sent me these, this lip gloss from Amazon and it tested over 2000 parts per million lead. Wow. When the lipstick threshold that they consider hazardous is around 10 parts per million. I don't know if they're lowering that to seven. And parts so, per million is worse than parts per billion, you guys. Like, yeah, right. It's like way more concentrated. So even though million sounds smaller than billion, it's actually yeah. more. So keep going. That's, Sorry. That's why that's confusing. I hadn't thought about yeah, it. Yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> so I can't test necessarily food or lipstick, but when I do test a food or lipstick item that's positive, It's outrageous because it's positive with an XRF instrument, which is way too much. With these products, let's say you get like lead free. Is it kind of similar to like, you know, we started seeing plastic that was like, it's BPA free. So we want to think that it's good, but then maybe it's replaced with, you know, BPS or something else. Mm -hmm. Is it, do you think it's that same kind of thing that like it's being replaced with something else now? Or is it like they left the lead out and we can feel good about that? First off, never believe anything that says lead free. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, there are very few exceptions to that for example um not an exception swiss pottery sells its pottery as lead free but it has trace lead um there's there's lots of different manufacturers that sell their products as lead free and they're not another one is extrema ceramic ceramic core cookware um they're sold as metals free but they have like 14 different metals in them Mm -hmm. when people companies uh especially smaller companies say that the product is lead free what they normally mean if it's a cookware product is that it's Mm non-leaching that at the time of manufacture the lead won't leach into your food the problem i have with that is that we don't know what happens to that beloved cooking pot or casserole dish you know 10 15 20 30 years from now and Mm -hmm. what we do know in the year 2021 is that we're using our grandmother's stock pots. Mm. We're using these cooking dishes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Mm-hmm. And so companies like, for example, Tupperware, when I found lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic in their vintage pieces from like 1990 and before, mm-hmm. Tupperware says, oh, well, you know, those are old pieces, but they can't use that as as a, an excuse because that their marketing campaign has always been that these products will last forever right. and they do. Right. And so the problem is that they're not taking responsibility for their legacy products. Mm-hmm. So that's a tangent on the lead free conversation. So there's lots of products. I mean, I, I probably have a couple dozen products on my blog where right. I found companies saying that something's lead free and it's not. Yeah. And the, the thing that bugs me 
is that they don't make a big deal when they switch. And they should. When they yeah. finally switch, they should say, hey, we're finally let free. We made a mistake. Instead, it should they- be a marketing campaign, like a massive marketing campaign. You should be yelling this from the rooftops. Why is it so quiet? Right. Mm-hmm. And so one of the big ones was Marble King marbles. They made lead free marbles and they marketed them for like, we've been making lead free marbles for a hundred years. And I like, I found that they had lead in their marbles. Oh my gosh. So when I published that they had lead in their marbles, their lawyer called me, basically threatened me, told me I had to take down my posts. I'm like, I'm not taking down the posts because you think they're wrong. Um, so these marbles still have lead in them. And then I kind of forgot about it because I, I just told people, you know, pretty much all marbles have lead. I haven't really found a brand of marble that's lead free. And mm-hmm. I checked back last year and they changed all their language. They no use, no longer use the lead free language. Well, so they made a positive change mm-hmm. and they stopped greenwashing a product. Yeah. But there's still vendors reselling their products out there as lead free. Yeah. And they never made an announcement that, hey, we're not actually lead free. We made a mistake. Right, right. Can we, I want to circle back to now the kitchen because one of your questions here is, can your family be poisoned by leaded dishes? I didn't even know we had leaded dishes. How do we even know if we have leaded dishes? What are leaded dishes? Why do dishes have lead in them? Like what, like, Mm -hmm. can you tell I am just in this like state of despair? I should probably have put a trigger warning on this podcast and be like, guys, I am in tons of despair right now. Be mindful with your emotions. Maybe turn this off for another day and listen to it when you're in a good mood. So I'm sorry, we digress. Tell us about the lead base. Okay, before you do, I actually did this test on my cooking pans where I boiled water, put baking soda in and and then tasted them. And when I tasted it, I tasted salt and metal from my dishes, from my baking pans. And I was irate because one of my pans was like a green pan and it was supposed to be non-toxic. And all I could taste was metal and I couldn't get metal out of my mouth. And so like, where did you hear that? I don't know that I, I I've seen, I guess I've seen that, but I don't know that, that I've done that before. It's, 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 it's gnarly. Very, you can do it with any of your pans and if it, it should just taste like water and, and baking salt. soda, that's yeah. what finally got me to change to no matter what, change my pans and invest mm-hmm. in good pans because if you do water and baking soda, it should taste just like water and baking soda. Right. And it tastes like metal. I hadn't heard that. Okay. Well, let's, I'll, I'll learn something new try, every day. I'll try it. To, try it, Tamara. <laughs> like, it's so nasty. You might nasty. be able to find it online. It's called a pot test. Like, you might, you might be able to find it online. In Oregon, that would come up differently. <laughs> What's that? I mean, that's true. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. But tell us about like lead in dishes and like this issue that like these are things that we're cooking with and eating off of. So what are lead in dishes and how do we find ones that are not? Well, so the problem is politics. And um, so the problem is that companies will tell you their dishes are lead free when they're not. They were non leaching at the time of manufacture within the leach testing standards that they applied Mm -hmm. at the time of manufacture. If they say that they're lead free Mm -hmm. or they'll say they don't know about the lead content or they'll say, We've always complied with all federal standards. Well, that's the big red flag. Yes, because federal federal standards are terrible. They're so bad. Sorry, keep going. (laughs) Well, and and the main thing is like with the vintage dishes, when they say they've always complied with all federal standards, there wasn't a federal standard Mm -hmm. for lead in dishes at at the time of some of the the manufacture of some of these items. And a main thing that is um, outrageous as well in that in that realm is that, for example, the Pyrex bowls, oh, it just maddens me. So I don't know if you know, but I've been written up in Snopes four times. No, didn't know that. So two of the times they used me to show that something was true. Mm -hmm. And two of the times they wrote disparaging articles that kind of, one of them says, oh, everything that I do with the XRF is legitimate. And another one says that my tests on Pyrex bowls are are not necessarily true, but they don't have actual science showing that they have somebody doing a wrong test um, with the wrong machine. That's like $5,000 instead of $50,000. So mm -hmm. it's it's (laughs) not exactly, but anyway, the interesting thing about the Pyrex bowls is that they pretty much all, this is the vintage ones. They all are covered with lead paint and exterior. It's the exterior paint. People are like, well, even if it is lead, it's only on the outside. And, and getting back to the regulatory standards, there's, almost, I don't believe there's any regulatory standard that requires leach testing to be done on the outside of a vessel. So you can paint the outside of your mug, the outside of your Le Creuset pots and pans, the outside of any of your Pyrex mixing bowls with lead or cadmium paint 
or glaze and it won't pa- it'll pass a leach test because they're not doing leach right. testing on the outside however that outside coating if you notice especially with the pyrex you're stacking them mm-hmm. and so when you stack them and you hold it up to light afterwards you see that the the coating is coming off in micro particulates that you can actually see yeah. and yeah. that means when you stack them you, you wash your dishes you stack them on top of each other and the exterior coating goes onto the inside of the one below it. And that's, it's probably not a significant source, but it's not an insignificant. It's not like, it's not a a negligible source. It's a source of potential lead exposure. People should know that their dishes have lead. So that's the thing that bugs me the most is that this, the outside of the bowl, the outside of the mug, again, with mugs, it's almost, it's modern mugs, it's all mugs, um, can still be quite toxic, even if they pass leach testing standards. Now, that's a separate consideration from the fact that dishes often have high levels of lead in the glaze. In 2019, I bought several Christmas dishes at Fred Meyers and at Sur La Table and places like that. And those were 10,000, 12,000 parts per million lead in the glaze. Yes, they were leech tested. They weren't going to poison someone that year. But Mm -hmm. if they were used daily, the cute little snowman dish was used daily or was used for decades, it might eventually start leaching. Yeah. And that's, a oh, there's so many layers here. But the other piece of that is that they can sell this dish with the cute snowman on it as an adult dish and it's legal. Mm-hmm. But if it was labeled that as a dish for children, it would mm. be illegal. Insane. But it has a snowman on it. Insane. It's like, it's a kid. And I think a lot of the confusion too, is that a lot of people associate this exposure with low quality or cheap things. But right. I see even very expensive cookware that has a very expensive, you know, brand name to it. And it's, mm-hmm. it has the same stuff. That's what yeah, I've been learning. That's as well. true. And actually it's the other way around. Mostly the more expensive stuff is going to be high lead. Unbelievable. Uh, the higher it's, there's a myth that if it's white, it's going to be lead free. That's not true. But if it's really highly decorated, it is more likely to have lead mm-hmm. and cadmium and cadmium causes cancer. And you asked a question earlier about what are they replacing this with? You know, are they replacing it like the BPA, BPS stuff? Well, they're often replacing the lead with cadmium yeah. because oh. cadmium gives you bright colors and pop and cadmium causes cancer. Unbelievable. So the dishes, a quick answer is that Vintage dishes, and when I say vintage, I mean 20 years or older, are much more likely to have lead. And that includes your Mikasa, your Crate and Barrel, your Pottery Barn, all of those ones you think are fine. If you are married 10 years or more and you've got dishes from for your wedding, no matter what brand they are, those are probably leaded. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were married in the last five years, your dishes that you got for your wedding are probably not leaded. Dollar Store has lead-free dishes. Amazing. So, wow. Interesting. Unbelievable. Not all of their dishes, but they have some lead free mm-hmm. dishes. You know? Walmart has lead free dishes. Some Target mm-hmm. has lead free dishes. I, I recommend sticking with glass, clear glass yeah. or um, like the Corel white glass with no decorative elements. Ikea has those for 99 cents each. I mean, it doesn't have to be expensive to get the lead out of your kitchen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one thing you said, touched on earlier is that you know, people are wondering, well, how can I get this instrument myself? I need to be able to test everything in my home because this is an inaccessible technology for most people. And because you need to be trained and certified in using the instrument, that's the reason I created my blog. That's why I have over 2,700 posts and I try and add to it every day where I have more information about new dishes. You can look up your dishes. There's a little video showing how you how to use the blog, which people are like, I don't want to watch a video. Don't use the <laughs> blog. But it's really a database. When you have a comprehensive mm-hmm. database, it's mm-hmm. you have to take a little time to figure out how to use it. Yeah. It's very impressive. You, you've really put together a very robust resource for people that it is really impressive. It is. How do you go about then finding those products? Because you said you don't currently have the technology with you. Like, how do you go about finding? Well, right now I have like thousands of things to write about that I haven't written about yet. Mm, wow. But you've pre-tested though. That's amazing. Yeah. So go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to say it. I broke my leg and I'm sitting here with oh, a broken no. leg. Like, ah, I I'm, can barely get anything done. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So that, that kind of leads me to one of my, oh gosh, I wish this was like a two hour podcast because we need to do a part two. And Gina, I know we're bringing on um, Kelly Clark to talk about like clean pots and pans and the chemicals and pots yes. and pans another time. So what you led with Tamara is amazing, but 
I want to give people hope. <laughs> Can we end on like a, because we, we all know now this is a very, very big problem and we are exposed to it all the time. Go watch the documentary, but what are the simplest things parents can do to protect their children from lead exposure? And, and how can we, how do we navigate our world now where we can be educated, not overwhelmed and take empowering steps to protect us? So I'm going to, I'll try and do a two part answer. One about my blog. So let's say mama.com yes. when people I think, I think one of my best posts that I wrote recently was my post about pots and pans. And so if you look up pots and pans, you'll see this post with a picture that's like a collage of a bunch of different pots and pans. Mm -hmm. The reason I like that post and it's emblematic of my work is that I tell you in that post, I don't care what brand you buy. I'm not trying to sell you a specific product. I'm different from a lot of bloggers in that way. A lot of bloggers out there are like, they have affiliate relationships with all these different products. Mm -hmm. I have very few affiliate relationships and I don't push those products and instead, in my blog posts, I tell you, this is what you need to know to buy safe pots and pans. These are guidelines. Now go forth and buy any pot and pan you want mm -hmm. that matches these guidelines. And so I have a lot of, of posts like that same. I have posts like that for choosing safe mugs and choosing safe casserole dishes. So it's not about buying what I'm recommending. I'm, it's about teaching the reader what is simple and how to buy lead free. And once you dive into some of those posts, it's pretty obvious and you can make those choices from an informed place for yourself. Mm -hmm. And in wow. general, you know, the nutshell of that is, you know, buy clear glass, undecorated, don't use um, stainless, I mean, sorry, don't use cast iron with uh, enamel coatings or, or don't use stainless uh, with enamel coatings. Don't use mm -hmm. any enamel coatings, plain stainless steel, plain cast iron, plain glass and mix things up. And in terms of ceramics, Try and avoid ceramics unless you know the potter and know whether or not they actually don't use lead in their glazes. That's mm -hmm. the best way to go. There's a couple examples on the blog. And, you know, it's actually not complicated and not expensive to have a lead-free home and lead-free kitchen. It's just about simplifying. Go back to your grandmother or your great-grandmother and think what they used to have. Don't, uh, it depends on how old you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can I just ask too, like, cause I know I get this question all the time and I don't actually know the data, but you know, I get so many questions on what do you think about like the green pans that are coated, mm. but they're, you know. Yeah. Well, that's in my pots safer, of paper. <laughs> quote unquote. I know nobody can see my finger quotes. <laughs> I, I, um, I tested the green pans and they tested positive for metals. I tested the always pan. It tested positive for toxic metals. Oh, and and like I was saying, you know, what they replace things with, they might not have lead, but then they'll have antimony or they'll, mm. they might not have lead, but then they'll have cadmium. Yeah. And so, you know, really avoid any aluminum based pots and pans. So that's like the specific in terms of uh, shopping guidelines. And I've got a lot of that on the blog. In, in general, you don't need to worry that everything has lead. Everything doesn't have lead. But if you purchase newer things for your family, in general, you'll be more safe than if you use vintage Vintage things should be cherished as objet d'art and not as cookware. If you think you might use something every day for your feeding your family and or that someone might accidentally use it, like a big one is those strawberry shortcake decorated glasses from like McDonald's or wherever they're from. Everyone, your guys' ages, I don't know, you're both your different ages, but everyone has these strawberry shortcake glasses they got. And, I have no you know, idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but you're I'm sure older. I'm sure listeners are picking up what you're putting down, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like the um, collector's glasses that have animals on them and, okay. and care bears and, and um, oh, anyway, all the different characters. Don't use those for your children. Yeah. Smash them. If yes. you really think somebody might use it later and it's toxic, get rid of it okay. because you don't want to have that as a temptation. Because why? Yeah. Why would you add lead to your life when you don't have to? And I got to tell you, this is coming from me, a mom whose children have permanent brain damage from being lead poisoned. Mm -hmm. now, this is not me saying, oh, this is bad in a theoretical way. My yeah. kid has brain damage, he has a visual memory in the fourth percentile. He is the smartest kid you've ever met. He's been sugar free for almost two years now. Mm -hmm. um, he's a very smart kid. He knows how to take care of himself, but he can't read anywhere near grade level because he has a brain injury. So he has to come up with new ways to learn and new ways to process information. And life is a struggle for him every day. He has severe OCD. He has ADHD and dyslexia and all sorts of learning disabilities. And I want 
to protect your kids from being exposed. Oh, yeah. So don't compromise when it comes to lead. Right. You know, if, if you think something might have lead, look it up on my blog, ask me a question, find out if it has lead and then don't use it anymore. Exactly. Was there a specific um, source of like a, a specific, you know, lead poisoning from him that you guys knew about or was it over time and then you tested? He was, this is in the, in the movie, he was acutely poisoned. Avi was acutely poisoned when a painter we hired used an open flame torch to burn the paint off the exterior of our house. And this was a house in a very fancy part of town where all the Nike executives mm-hmm. live and fancy people Aww. live. We had a tiny house in a fancy part of town. And so it was like it was an old house, but our doctor's like, oh, you live in Irvington, so there's no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're middle income, you're white, there's no problem. Yeah. Because Aww. the political machine has pumped out misinformation that it's, mm-hmm a low income black problem or a low income minority problem. And it's not, it's an everyone problem. Yes. And that's mm-hmm. not to say that minorities aren't disproportionately affected because they don't have the financial resources because of other impacts on their lives to, to deal with these things, but it, everyone can be impacted. And that's why we all need to be hyper vigilant and make sure that we're making safer choices for our family. I also want to point out that contractors are very minimally fined when they have been caught practicing unsafe contractor practices when it comes to lead. I think like the fine is like a thousand bucks or something, but you potentially have a child damaged, like brain damaged for life because it's more expensive for contractors to remove paint in a safe way. It takes more resources, more time, more money. And so when two contractors come in with, with a bid and the one who's removing lead safe is more expensive. And then the person who gives the bid that's cheaper and they're doing unsafe removal of lead, most people will go for the cheaper bid because we are uneducated about this topic. And so I I have a question for you. That's great. That's great. I love that you watched my movie. (laughs) Everyone should watch it. (laughs) So many people say that they're afraid to watch my movie. And I tell them, you don't know what it's going to be. It's a crash course. It's an education. It'll Mm -hmm. give you so much information at once. And I did it I created the movie because I can't talk to every parent, you know, but I think that every parent needs this information. And instead of the information coming from me, it's from the mouths of scientists. It's Mm -hmm. not, I'm not, and none of the facts come out of my mouth. They all come out of the scientists. So I was wondering if you have any words of encouragement again to, to, for people who are afraid to watch the movie. (laughs) Um, Watch it because you'll feel super empowered because here's the thing. When I first initially started talking to you, I wanted to put my head in the sand. I did. I remember how I said, I'm like, I'm going to call you Monday. And there was that pull where I'm like, oh, I don't want to look at this truth. And then I just ripped the bandaid off and I watched and like, there's a fire that got ignited in me. And I feel like just listening to this podcast, you now know more than like probably 95% of Americans just in this one hour, you know, watch the documentary, but there's so much information here already. Like you're already there guys. Like you've already heard the heart of the heart. Now just go and get the details of the heart and the heart and learn more about the political side of it too. Because politics is a big, big part. That's what we haven't covered today. That's what we could probably spend an hour covering, but we won't. So just go watch the documentary and follow the trail of money. Because because you're here now. You're at the end of this episode. You're listening. You're already tainted. Your head is already out of the sand. And you're looking at this at this demon head on. You can't go back. You can't go back. You can't unhear what you've heard now. So I I don't want to like tell people like, just go watch because I was hesitant. I will be honest because ignorance is bliss, but you know what? Ignorance also leads to dysfunction, dis-ease. This is our children. This is why I love moms. And this is why I love our community is because women, women protecting their babies are the ones that are always like calling out. They're always, always, always trying to protect their protect their little ones, you know, and we know that we have this power and we have this intuition and, and we have this driving force, this protective driving force. And what also makes me really sad too, is that the higher ups, the politicians, the doctors, not all doctors, there's a lot of great doctors, but, but people try to dumb us down, right? This is why I like this platform because we will be dumbed down no more. So go watch the, go watch it, you guys, because we are the ones with the power. We are the ones that cry out we are the ones that start moving mountains and it takes all of us to do it together because the politicians are not going to do it for us. That's what we've learned every time. And you learn this in the documentary too. Every time things are changed, it's because of moms and teachers and community members. It's not because of the higher up guys because they've been bought. 
So we have to I'm, listen. I want a standing ovation. <laughs> like I want the, the audience to get up and. It, it wouldn't be a podcast episode yes. without like my little like massive tangent, yeah, you know, it. mic drop, boom. Um, yes. Like it, it takes us, you guys. This is why we're here. This is why we're banding together. It takes our power. But this is what we're doing. We're taking our power back. So get some more empowerment from Tamara. She's such an, an incredible source and she's so passionate. She even puts her cell phone number on at the end of this documentary. I said before we started recording, I'm like, Tamara, are you sure you want people reaching out to you? Don't call or text her, she said. So if you want some more information, go to her blog post. You can text her because she's amazing. As you can tell, she's so passionate about this. She didn't want to do this. But because she's like you and because she's like me, her child got injured and she got a fire lit under her butt. And now she's moving mountains. This is what we can do together. OK, let's let's keep moving mountains. Let's keep pushing for changes in our environment, you guys. And that's it. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> have you done a TED Talk? You need to do a TED Talk. No, I have not. <laughs> no one has invited me to do a TED Talk yet. I don't know why. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, and I'd love to um, get to know you better. I, I, I have a lot of families in Utah who want me to come there. So oh. I'm probably going to be there. You should come so. and do a talk. Tell us when you're coming. Like, let's do like a massive talk and Q&A. Like, let's, let's do something. Like, let's get you out in the public. Tamara, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your resources. The outpour of hours that you have put into this mission to educate people like us because I had no clue two weeks ago, none. And I wanted to stay ignorant and I'm so glad I didn't. So thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. And Gina, thank you for co-hosting with me. Oh, you always bring the of best course. questions, the best, best questions. Holy cow. Um, again, you guys, ledsafemama.com. And then on Instagram, she's at ledsafemama. Let's get her tons and tons and tons of followers. Let's give her some love and support because this is something that needs to continue on. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Until next week, we'll hear you then. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.